Hello everyone. Hello, this is Jo Grimman coming to you from all the way across the world from Australia. Um, I work, I'm from the University of Wollongong and I'm going to share the wonder of discovery and explore science in the outdoor environment with you today. So I'm just going to share my screen. And we'll get started. So the wonder of discovery, and I just love the image on the screen of this little girl putting her face in the middle of a sunflower, using her sense of smell to explore that beautiful big sunflower. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge and thank um, Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this wonderful um, initiative, Parenting During a pan Pandemic and Beyond, a reality. Um, it's been wonderful to be a part of this program during this really difficult time the world is facing. Just like to before I start, um, we're going to, I'm going to ask for some questions so that if you could keep your questions to the end, and I'll answer as many questions as I can in the time. In Australia, before we present, we like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, and um, custodians across the many lands that we, we meet. So I'm going to do that because I'm coming to you from Australia. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the many lands across Australia. I acknowledge the contribution made by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with particular reference to the education of young children, and I recognise their existence long before our story began. Wollongong University, where I work, is located on land traditionally owned by the Wadi Wadi people of the Darawal Nation, so I pay res my respects to them. However, I come to you today from my home on the south coast of New South Wales on Ewan Country, which is about six hours drive south of Sydney, if you know where Sydney is. So today, the presentation, we're going to explore what emergent science learning looks like in the early years in, with particular reference to the outdoor environment. Last week, if you joined me, we explored science inside in the indoor environment. Today, we're going to take the learning outside. We will explore how we see science in our everyday and how we can use the outdoor environment for learning about science. We will explore some simple science experiences or activities that we can engage with our children in the home during this time. So what is emergent science? So let's start by exploring what I like to term emergent science learning. What does this learning look like in the early years? As your child's first teacher, um, your role is vitally important in creating lots of opportunities that promote scientific learning in playful scenarios. And we can do this in the outdoors and we can bring the outdoors inside as well during this time. Essentially learning through play and exploring materials, posing questions and evoking wonder. Discovering alongside your child, which doesn't mean having all the answers and exploring scientific facts. As your child's first teacher, you can start building their scientific skills from an early age, creating a solid foundation for future learning. By encouraging your child to play, explore and investigate, you are certainly helping them become active participants in their own learning. Emergent science learning is a process that involves observing what can we see, observing what's outside, predicting what's going to happen, Looking at the weather, for example, what's going, predicting what's going to happen with the clouds moving in the sky, experimenting, verifying, explaining, hypothesizing, and testing out hypothesis. Children are naturally curious, so we can really tap into this natural inquisitiveness and sense of wonder in the outside. Emergent science learning is a way of thinking and working towards understanding our world. Um, and there's lots of to, to understand about the world at the moment in the time that we're living um, and the difference that it's making to our environment being inside and giving a, um, the, the natural environment a break from us as humans existing in it. So it's a way of thinking and working towards understanding the world. Emergent science in the early years is to understand through a process of inquiry, and I love this word, and we're going to look at this word a lot today, and engage in a process to organise and support our discoveries. 
It involves processes of making problem solving, investigation, exploration, experimentation. It's not only about learning content, rather about engaging in processes of scientific discovery. By children engaging in emergent science in play, they evoke wonder, they innovate and they make meaning in their play. We as the adult and the parents have a key role to play in this by engaging in the learning with our children. It's not our role to have all the answers, but we need to explore with them and engage in the wonder with the children, the wonder of discovery, the wonderment, I love that word. Emergent science involves engaging in scientific procedure and discovery. As agile adults, we can discover with the children. We need to also encourage them to notice things in our environment when we go outside. In the image, you can see a child looking at a butterfly with a magnifying glass. So ask your child what they can see and notice through, through that magnifying glass. You could also use technologies to support this learning by researching what type of butterfly is and learning facts about that butterfly and its life cycle is fantastic, rich learning and that science. You could then get your child to draw what he or she has seen. So we can explore science in the environment by noticing things and drawing our children's attention to things that are happening around us. Sometimes in our busy lives, we fail to stop and notice things. Children notice the tiniest details and we can stop and extend this learning. We can notice those tiny things as well. Asking questions can evoke this wonder, this wonderment. I wonder what happens to the little dandelion seeds when they fly through the air and we're gonna explore that later on. Watching leaves change color and pointing the changes out in the environment is all science learning. Why sometimes it's easier to make a snowball, snowball than other times, for example, and why? Why does a rainbow appear after the rain? Why do leaves fall from the trees and why do leaves change colour in different seasons? Just taking notice of our environment and pointing out and discovering things is enhancing science discovery in the outdoor environment. So children naturally explore and, and learn about their environments through inquiry, discovery and investigation in this digital world that we live in. And especially this time, during this time, during this pandemic, children are connected with technology. Their iPads are connected to them. They walk around with them. My son certainly does. And you may have difficulty getting them to do anything else at times. So use this interest to foster investigation. Go outside and explore the environment and see what you can capture with the iPad or digital camera or iPhone, if you have one. If you find an insect or an animal with you in your garden, if you have a garden with your child, use the iPad or phone to take photos and learn facts about them. Use the technology as a tool for research. You can see in the image a child taking a video of her silkworms that she has as pets. You can have your child take little videos of insects they find in the outdoors, of spiders, and just take time to watch and notice them. So technology can certainly be an active tool for research and scientific discovery in the outdoors. It can be a tool to learn more about and explore the environment and build knowledge. It can encourage sense of wonder. It can enhance learning by enhancing the children's interests. So if you are having trouble getting your child away from technology to explore the outdoors, get them to take it with them to document the learning. You never know what you may find in the outdoor environment, so keep your eyes of wonder and discovery open. If you don't have much of a backyard, then go for a walk in the neighbourhood and see what you can notice with your child. You may see a bird's nest or hear a bird flying overhead. You may see leaves changing colour bark falling off trees or other changes in the environment, clouds flying overhead gradually. You may just experience changes in the weather that can be a source of investigation. Why is it getting so cold for us all of a sudden? Why is it becoming hotter through the day? Talk to that about your, with that about with your child. It's amazing when you're open to, when you are open to really taking the time to notice things in our environment, this allows for rich science discovery and can lead to science inquiry and investigation using technology. When I was teaching, I'm going to sh share a story with you now. When I was teaching at my preschool, because I'm a preschool teacher, I had a very unexpected visitor one day in the room. 
we had we had incubated chicken eggs in an incubator so we had actually hatched two baby chickens inside and the children were discovering that was rich scientific learning of discovering um, and experiencing babies hatch chicken ba uh, babies hatching out of eggs so one day I had discovered that a huge hawk had entered the preschool room it had smelt the chickens and come inside to investigate when I finally caught it and released it, it was very difficult, but I did. Um, it then led a science discovery to research what kind of hawk it was. Um, and we found out that it was actually a hawk that liked to visit um, inside buildings and come inside looking for small um, farm animals, for example. So that was very, very interesting. So do that with your children. Another time a child found a very unusual bug in the playground and you could find bugs in, in, in your um, yards if you have one or, or the park. And we used technology to research what kind of insect it was and its habitat and what it ate. When you engage in the learning with your child, it evokes excitement, interest and enthusiasm in you. And as your child's teacher, and this transfers to the child and vice versa. So have a go and discover with your child. Use technology, use their interest in technology to engage in discovery with your children. So now we're going to look, we're going to watch a little video of that in action um, using an iPad. This is actually a preschool teacher using an iPad to investigate butterflies markings and talk to that about that with the children. This is from the Early Childhood Australia website. So I encourage you to have a look at the websites. There's lots of so that's the sort of thing that frightens you, but the sort of thing that might frighten an owl or a tawny frog owl or a different bird are these spots. And what do they look like? Eyes. They look like eyes. Are they really eyes? No. Why are they there then? They're the butterflies. They don't. They're Scared animals don't know that they're butterflies. You're right, this, the other animals don't know they're butterflies. They think they're a bigger creature because these look like eyes, don't they, on the, on the edge of And what do they look like? They look like eyes. Are they really eyes? Why are they there then? They're butterflies. They don't. The scared animals don't know that they're butterflies. You're right. This, the other animals don't know they're butterflies. They think they're a bigger creature because these look like eyes, don't they, on the, on the edge of the butterfly? So when a, when an owl comes along and sees that, what do you think he'll think? What will he think when he comes along and sees this? Um, I can see the eyes and I'll get scared. He will. Will he think it's a butterfly? No, no. He'll think it's, um, it's a very big creature. Think it's a very big creature and he'll think to himself, oh, I better not have him for myself. Mm. Mm. That human like butterflies. Yes, Mrs. Robertson. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what did you say? Human like butterflies. <laughs> You're right. We like butterflies, don't we? We love yeah. them. Why do we like them, do you think? Because they're beautiful. Because they're beautiful. They do look beautiful and they're very good for the garden, aren't they? Yeah. Um, the predators eat them. The predators eat them, yes. You're right, they do. So what what here is stopping the predators eat them? Why won't predators eat this particular butterfly? Because it has eyes in them and they think um, it's actually um, a, a big um, creature. Oh, okay, so the predator will come along and see those, think it's a big creature, and not eat it. Oh. So hopefully you were able to see that okay um, and hear that okay. Um, but I will, we will um, make the, the link to that, those websites available um, after this workshop and I have some others that, that um, we could add to the website as well. So, um, so the Nature Kindergarten, um, here are some images from Claire Ward and Mind Stretchers Academy that, that I'd really love to share with you. Um, and um, this has recently been shared by my colleagues, so it isn't included in your handout. 
but it's full of wonderful free resources that you can access online. So we will um, add them to the website after the, the webinar, to the, after the workshop today, so that you can ac access them. So um, the Nature Play Diary in particular is a free resource that's perfect for playing with children in the early years, taking inspiration from nature. It's made up of many free downloadable sheets for parents and carers so that they can create their own nature play diary. And it will help, help you create ideas and plans with your children, gather ideas um, to do inside, outside and beyond and share images of things that, that you can do together to create a diary of wonderful memories. Um, the children can take their diary back to their early year setting, their preschool or their school when they return. So their experiences can be explored further. So when you go back to school after the break, um, they might be able to share that with them as well. And it's also the Nature Play Diary has also got some support notes and comes with a free online talk for parents and carers on how to use inquiry-based learning, that beautiful word that I love so much, to bring out the best um, in, in our children's play and learning. And she's, Claire Warden is an educational consultant who has developed her approach to nature, pedagogy, and experiential learning through a variety of experiences. So we're going to watch a little bit of her video now, and we're going to look, explore um, flying, what is flying? So that scientific discovery of flying. So I'm going to try sharing that through here. I'm just going to have this chat open so I can see it before I start. So just see how we go. I'm just going to watch about 10 minutes of this. Hello, welcome from Auckland Nature Kindergarten. It's great to have you here. This is one little film which is part of a much bigger project called Living Classrooms, the Virtual Nature School and it's funded by the Scottish Government. So we're delighted to have friends here from both Scotland, but also from all over the world, beaming in via the YouTube channel. If you're from Scotland or anywhere else in the world, make sure you put a little comment in that box. It would be great to be able to read some of your ideas and thoughts as we're going along. So I've got a couple of friends with me here today and my team members from Auckland Nature Kindergarten. We have a whole variety of different children who come and go here. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to watch the provocation video with you at the same time. And then we'll be able to chat through some of our ideas about what we might be doing in response to today's inquiry. Don't forget, these inquiries last five days. So you have plenty of time to have a go at the different things. Sure Even if you go, don't get five, it done by one o'clock um, today, you can do it at any time. The... All right. Talk to you soon. Welcome to the Virtual Nature School. I'm Claire Warden and I'm the person who's going to be helping you through exploring the idea of flying. This is getting ready and that means that we're going to be thinking about lots of the possibilities. And then as our inquiry develops, we'll be looking at all of your ideas and including those in what we're doing. One of the things that fascinates me about flying is when you sit outside and you watch the birds fly, it looks such a simple thing to do. But when you actually try to make something that's going to fly, whether it be a paper aeroplane or a model, it actually becomes really, really difficult. That's why it's a great inquiry to do. And don't forget that the whole point of doing inquiries is that we don't mind getting things wrong. It's okay to make mistakes. What we try and do is write down all of our ideas in a memory book or in our learning journal. So you might take photographs of what you're doing, you might write down your ideas, you might draw the thing you're going to make or draw something from memory, a place that you've been or something that you've done. The good thing about that memory book is that you're going to be able to take it with you throughout this journey, but also into school or into a setting somewhere to show your family. Let's have a look then inside the talking tub. And remember, the talking tub is the place where we put photographs, we put um, other kinds of images, we put objects. And the talking tub is a wandering place. It's where we ask ourselves questions. We can say, I wonder if, I wonder how, what might be the possibility of this? So it's quite a philosophical place where we don't have to worry about getting it right or getting it wrong, because this is all about the thinking. 
And so when I opened up the talking tub, one of the things that I thought it would be interesting to wonder about would be how do things fly? Because when we look inside that talking tub and we think about the birds that surround us, as I said, they seem to do it effortlessly. How is it this little tiny blue tick can fly so quickly after hatching out of an egg? What is it about that wing that makes it such an effective tool to lift up the bird and help it fly? Some birds have the most acrobatic flight and their wings seem to be able to guide and glide them around the sky. There are other things that we've got that fly and some of those have been man-made by us. Many of us have had a go at making paper planes and we'll certainly be exploring the idea of paper planes and structuring things as if we are engineers later on. The other thing that flies are things that go up like balloons. Can you imagine being inside one of these balloons as it takes off from the earth and goes up into the sky? So we're going to have a little bit of an investigation around balloons and the idea of buoyancy and how things take off like that using the idea of heat. What I want to do is focus a little bit on this little plant. This could be the way that you've seen a dandelion, which is when you're walking along a pavement, you can often see them pushing their way up in what seems like a really hard place to live. I wonder how this little yellow flower manages to spread its seeds so very well across wide areas of grass. How is it a plant can grow on a pavement? But when we start to have a closer look and we stop running through things, but slow down on our walk in the park, you might just see these yellow flowers peeping up. And it would be a really good time to be able to slow down and have a look at one really carefully. Because the closer you look, the more you realize that they are amazing. We're looking at that ball of white in the front of the picture. This ball of what looks like fluff. So let's go inside there and have a closer look. So when we go into plants like dandelions, we begin to see that what looks like one ball of fluff is actually hundreds of little tiny seeds. They've all got these little tiny parachutes attached to them. When we look closely at a dandelion seed, we can see these beautiful lines that radiate out from a central point. And if you've ever blown a dandelion, there are all sorts of games we can play where we see how many breaths it is to get rid of all the seeds off the dandelion clock. If we get a group of dandelions and shake them, we can see here what looks like thousands of little parachutes taking off and spreading out so they can all make new plants in the environment. When you look very closely at a dandelion, and you take one of those little seeds and go into it with a magnifying glass, this is what it looks like. So you have those little fine areas at the top and then you have a long stem and then the bottom of the stem is that thickened brown bit, that's the seed. And in that seed, there's enough information to grow a whole new dandelion plant. What we're fascinated about in our inquiry around flying is how do you do that? How do you make something fly with like a parachute at the top? Is it possible for us to even do that? Well, when we look closer, we can see that actually there are many seeds that are attached in this way, not just a dandelion plant, but other plants that are like it. So there's something important about having a seed or something heavy. There's something important about having something to catch the wind at the top. These are actually thistle down and they've come from a thistle plant. And you can see here that they too had these long filaments to catch the air. Unfortunately for these seeds, something else has caught them. These have been caught in a spider's web. I wonder if they'll ever get to the ground and make a new plant. So what human beings have done is to look at things that have parachutes. We look at seeds like a dandelion seed, and it gives us ideas about how we could trap the wind. 
So here's a parachute with somebody attached to it, and we can see those long lines coming down to the straps on his harness. So there's important thinking here about something to capture the wind, something to attach it to the important part, whether it's a seed for a new dandelion plant, a human being, or maybe just an object. Here's another parachute, but this one, rather than being long and thin, is a round parachute. On this one, this is a Paris ending sail, and they run off the cliff and try to capture the wind underneath the great big sail that they have. So they've launched themselves in a different way, a little bit like those seeds being blown out from the dandelion clock. So I wonder, I wonder what we could do in terms of making parachutes. I wonder if we could go out into the outside space and look at all the possibilities for things to make a parachute with. You're going to have to make some decisions about what your cargo is going to be. Is it going to be a toy? Is it going to be a seed? Is it going to be a stone? What are you going to put on your parachute to see if it will fly? And then, of course, we have to work out how to make the parachute and how far the parachute will go. So there's a lot of inquiry around maths and around problem solving, around the physics of flight. Now, this is an interesting shot in our talking tub, because in this photograph, it looks like there's a hole at the top of the parachute. There seems to be holes around the outside, too. So parachutes don't seem to be completely solid. They seem to have bits where you can let the air out. This is a view from a parachute looking down. Can you imagine? That must be the view that a bird has when it flies across the shoreline. Something you might like to do today in your inquiry is to go out to investigate your environment. Dandelions come in all sorts of different ways. They can be very open, they can be closed up, they can be just a bud, they can be just the stem, they could actually be the, just one of those dandelion clocks that we saw earlier on. So you want to go outside to find your dandelions. It might be you need to go for a walk in the park. It might be that you just go out into the garden. See if you can spot dandelions and see if you can find a dandelion clock and watch as the seeds move away. You could decide that you want to make a parachute using just natural materials, in which case you might want to look in the space where you are, go for a walk to the park or look in your garden and find different types of leaves and see if you can make those just by bending them into some sort of parachute shape. If you're feeling that you're an engineer today, just stop it there, um, but you can see on the screen how I'm encouraging you to um, have a go at making a parachute um, with your child. But I will, um, I will add these series of um, fantastic videos to explore air, um, properties of air with your child um, after the workshop because I certainly, um, they're certainly fa fabulous resources and gives you wonderful ideas. So just to, to wrap up in your handout, I've also included an activity to explore um, gravity and how objects interact with the air. I was lucky enough to actually be up in one of those parachutes a few times. So um, yes, it reminded me of looking down and having that amazing view from the air. But we can also um, test out how different things um, react with the air as well and how they're um, propelled with air. So just by um, using paper, by using two pieces of paper just like this in our hands and getting our child um, to experiment with which one will fall to the ground the fastest um, is a fantastic inquiry. And I love, again, going back to that word inquiry, scientific inquiry. Um, then, then you could also test test um, what would happen and make a hypothesis about what would happen if you crunched up the piece of paper and had one drift to the, to the ground, one scrunched up and one flat piece of paper drifting to the ground. Get your children to, to um, predict what might happen, which one would fall first. Um, then, then you could just get the children to describe what's happening and why. 
ask your child to fan their cheeks with their hands and discuss how air cannot be seen, but it can be felt. And this may lead to a discussion about how air can make things move. Like last week, we had, um, we were blowing ping pong balls with straws, such, but, but um, what other things can we think of that moves with air, like leaves moving in the wind, a kite flying or clouds moving across the sky? Invite your child to test how fast other objects fall, such as balls or various sizes and weights, feathers and sheets of paper of different sizes. Try cardboard and compare that. So what's happening? The force of gravity pulls objects towards Earth and air resistance slows down falling objects. The shape of an object affects how much air it has to push through and heavier objects push against air with more force than lighter objects. So heavier objects tend to fall faster than lighter objects. So you can talk to the, your child about that as well. Other things to support a sense of wonder in the garden, if you're lucky enough to have a garden or, or going for a walk to the park, if you don't have a garden in your home, um, when you're able to go for a walk. So when you're hand out, um, I've also included an activity to explore your garden or explore the park. Go on a treasure hunt with your child to find and document different things that you can find in the garden, different plants or different insects and animals that you find. Use technology to research the insects and animals and plants that you find and investigate habitats and interesting facts about them. Have your child document the different features or draw them. You can do this for other animals as well, like birds flying overhead and frogs. I'm lucky to enough to have frogs in my garden. Talk about camouflage and other defense mechanisms of animals. That's all scientific discovery. So a final reflection. Children need uninterrupted time to explore outdoors, to feel the textures of their surroundings and search for scientific revelations. Such experiences foster emotional connect connections with natural elements and help children develop a sense of respect for the environment and empathy for all living beings. Nature is also intriguing and deeply fulfilling to children because it is constantly changing, always surprising us, and continually teasing the senses. So um, I'm very surprised and, and just excited by the, the impact that, that we have had just giving nature a break and being, um, being inside during this pandemic and, and just giving, giving, letting nature um, recreate itself again, which has been really exciting um, to watch as well. So um, focusing on the positive. Young children become young scientists who are constantly theorising about how the world works, eager to collect, sample, compare, associate and test. A rich outdoor experience further this development like no other environment can. So next week we're going to, if you're um, going to join me next week, we're going to start thinking about maths in play. And we're going to, um, we're going to actually play together and I'm going to get you to put a collection of materials and objects together from your home so we can explore patterning and symmetry with those materials. So we'll, we'll play together um, next week. So we also are encouraging you to, um, if you do make a parachute, and I'm encouraging you to make a parachute or a paper aeroplane or other examples that I've um, given you in the handout. There's lots of different scientific um, explorations that you can create things with with your child. So try making something that flies and up, you can upload the picture to the website. Maybe you could make um, a parachute from nature. Maybe you could make a, um, a paper aeroplane and get your child to direct, de decorate it. Maybe you could paper, make a paper plane launcher so I've, I've um, added some, some links to websites to show you how to do that as well. You, maybe you can make something else from the handout and maybe you could, your child could do a drawing of a science discovery you have, something that you find outside, something that you um, discover in the outdoor environment. So we've come to the end of today. Um, thanks for listening. Any questions, I encourage you, encourage you now to ask some questions if you've got any through, through the chat. But I think I'd really love you to, um, to create something with your child after our workshop today. Um, maybe you could make a parachute and um, take some photos and post it to, to our um, website. We'll, we'll give you the details of how to do that.
that um, just start collecting some photos and images of, of your constructions and creativities. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen now and, um, and look for some questions. I'm going to start the ball rolling because I have got some questions um, that um, to start you off um, that sometimes that I get, potentially get about scientific discovery and playing in the outdoors. Um, so one of the questions I get is, my children are only interested in playing with technology or watching the television. How can I motivate them to go outside and explore? Now, you might remember what I was talking about at the beginning of the workshop, how I was talking about encouraging your child to use technology to, um, to explore nature. So using it to um, research things, using it to um, explore the environment, taking photos with, your, with their iPhone or their iPad or a digital camera, watching changes. So um, collecting um, information and photos about changes in the environment, changes in the weather, um, what happens in the sky, where the clouds go, um, maybe taking some, some leaving the, the video on and, and um, I'm watching the progress of the clouds and things like that. So getting your children motivated to use technology to document to document um, their learning is a great way or finding out about things that they can find in their garden or insects or whatever that you can find or just watching the trees blow. Um, discover, using technology to, to discover things like why do rainbows um, come after the rain um, and things like that. So researching different scientific um, experiences like that. Watching changes in weather is a great one. Has anyone else got any questions? Um, I'll go to my next question if there's nothing from anybody else. All right, so another question that, that I get, um, particularly in metropolitan areas, built up areas that don't have a lot of nature. I live in a concrete area with no nature around me. How do I connect to nature with my child? Um, so here, here's where that amazing virtual classroom is very handy to have um, as a part of your things to do with children. So um, we'll certainly share lots of those um, websites that I didn't include in the, in the handout um, with you to explore. There's also um, fabulous websites. Um, I know the San Diego Zoo have got virtual um, webcams on their animals that they in in real time so you can um, log in and watch animals like you were there at the zoo watching them so that's another great great thing to do if you haven't got a lot of nature around you is connecting to that david um, attenborough we know is fabulous with his documentary so um, find, exploring that with your children and talking to them about the different um, animals and the facts that that you're learning together so learning with them about different animals as well is great um, if you haven't got a lot of nature around you. But also just um, if you're living in an apartment where you don't have a garden, looking outside your window and just watching what's happening, um, watching the wind blowing, the, just taking notice of the little things, watching the wind blowing things, watching the clouds moving um, and, you know, um, bringing your child's attention to those things that are happening in the environment. Um, talking about the weather and the changes of the weather. Um, I know that, that it can be very hot. Um, so talk about that, um, that with your child and the, and the, um, the differences that that makes on our environment. I know in Australia, it's a very hot country in summer. Um, so talking about using things that are happening around you to, to, um, to talk about nature is a, another way to connect when you don't have um, a park. But if you've got a park, visiting to going for a walk um, if you're if you're able to in this time during this time walking your child to a park and seeing what you can explore there having that um, that sense of wonder and looking around your surroundings at what is around you looking at the trees looking at pointing at the color changes of leaves that are changing looking at leaves that are drying up and falling to the ground for example and why that's happening um, so taking notice of things that as adults we don't tend to notice so like looking through the lens as a child and looking at things that are happening around us 
and, and developing our own sense of wonder and wonderment in our surroundings um, to connect to nature when we don't have a lot of it around us. We may not have a garden, but also maybe I'm um, thinking about if you're, I don't know whether you're, it's available, but um, planting seeds and growing plants inside your house, so indoor plants, if you have indoor plants, so exploring, um, looking at them differently uh, as um, you see them every day but noticing those changes and noticing the, those leaves. And if you've got a magnifying glass, which is a fantastic tool um, to use to look through and you can make your own magnifying glasses. So um, there's a, a resource on, in the handout where it shows you how to make a magnifying glass if you don't have one. Um, but looking at those plants through a lens of a magnifying glass and, and taking note, note and getting your children to draw them and draw what they're seeing. It's amazing what um, they will discover from that as well. I'll just pause for a minute to let anyone else ask any questions. And I might ask another one that I've prepared. Nothing coming through yet. So another question is um, particularly pertinent, to, pertinent to, to your area and my area in Australia in the middle of summer. Our weather is too hot to go outside. Are there ways we can explore nature in our house? Now, I've just talked about plants and growing seeds from plants and virtual, um, engaging with those virtual experiences through the Clare Ward, an amazing virtual nature school and in, engaging in those videos and watching that and, and creating things um, in real time with, um, with your child is a great way to do that. But, but it is really important to get out when you can. So maybe finding a time through the day when it's not so hot. So in Australia, it's early in the morning or um, we have daylight saving time. So we have lots of sunlight at the end of the day and that's where um, children go out to play. So, and preschools and early childhood um, environments um, have sun safe policies. And I'm, I'm not sure if you do, but if you're in a, in a, a hot place, I'm sure that you would have, um, that you would have um, some policies in place with, um, with some protection. So we can't go outside um, in the middle of the day. So finding ways that you can go outside, whether that be um, getting a little bit more organized in the middle in the morning to actually engage in nature and go for a walk to the park would be a fantastic thing to do. And noticing things that we don't normally notice. Um, someone's just asked, is there a certificate after completing the workshop? I'm not sure if I can answer that one, um, but I can find out for you. Um, maybe someone can can answer that. Um, answer that for that question, that person that's asking that question. And I will get on to the next one while we're um, so some so I often get a, a question: does it matter if you don't have you know, scientific, the right equipment to explore science, like a magnifying glass that I've just shared. Certainly not. You can make your own um, and you can explore by just science discovery, by just sitting and watching and noticing things that are happening around you, listening, using our senses, so using our ears to listen to birds flying over overhead and, and the calls and researching, using technology to research and find out what kind of um, sound that bird was. Or um, in Australia, we have, um, we have a place and application that you can collect sounds of frogs. So we have, um, we can participate in research around collecting information um, of, um, of frogs. So, um, we, yeah, we can record, you can record on your phone the call that you're hearing on the bird, with the bird or whatever animal that you can hear and then use that, that sound to do some research with your child about and find out what type of bird that was and find out what type of frog that was because it doesn't matter if you don't know the answer. It doesn't matter if you don't, um, if you don't find the answer. The process of discovery is the most important thing with your child. And I've just seen somebody ask, um, may I know what age a child begins to discover from, from, from a baby, from the, the word go, they are discovering, they are noticing things around, around them. Their brain is developing at such a, a quick rate that they're taking all, even though that we may not know it, they're taking all this amazing information in from a baby and um, developing their synaps synapses in the brain. So certainly discovery happens from, from the, the time that they're out of the womb. 
So from baby, they are discovering their environment, they are looking around them, they are using, particularly using their senses to explore. So um, certainly from, from day one, I would say, just because they can't tell us and can't talk, doesn't mean that they, it's actually most of that learning happens from naught to five. That's when the most extensive brain development happen, happens and those synap synapses are working um, and developing more and more and more connections in the brain. Um, so that's, that's why early years are so important um, because that's when our foundation for lifelong learning happens. So it's important that we make the most of every opportunity with our children for that exploration and that discovery um, learning because um, we're, setting, we're giving them the best start and it's not necessarily all about learning facts um, and learning um, their numbers and their alphabet. It's about exploring it and having a, a better understanding because we want our children to be um, scientists. We want them to be explorers. We want them to be innovators. We want them to be able to create and innovate um, in this technology driven world that we live in. So the more that we can get them to do, to do, to discover and explore our environments and investigate and in the early years when they're, when they're the smallest is setting them up for a foundation of rich learning, for lifelong learning. So um, it's really, really important that we do all of these things um, early and just um, not, not have all the answers all the time. We don't need to have, we don't need, just because we're the adult, we don't need to have all the answers um, because it's really, um, it's really exciting for our children to know that we can discover too. And it's important for them to know that we never stop learning and that you never stop learning as an adult because that's what we want them to do. And we want them to understand that. So, any other questions coming through at all? We just might have one, one, I've got just one more on my list. Um, and then what we might come to the end, but um, um, I, another question I often get is, is talking about the weather, learning about science. Well, it certainly is because I've talked about that through the, the workshop, that just even though we may not be able to engage in um, scientific, disc in, in our gardens, or if we may not have a garden, or we may not be able to walk to the park, for example, we may not be close enough to walk our children to the park. Um, so noticing changes in the weather is scientific learning. Um, so yeah, exploring that with your children, talking about different um, weather patterns across the world is fantastic learning as well. So talk, um, comparing, for example, Australian weather conditions to, um, to that where you live. Um, and having conversations around that and noticing different changes in temperature and talking about that um, in the weather is certainly scientific learning. Um, so science is all around us and I think that's what I'm trying to get, get, get across today and last week that science is, is all about discovery and investigation and it's all around us and we never stop learning about our environments even as adults. We don't have all the answers and we need to to really um, promote that with our children so that they can be the future scientists. Um, you know, we need scientists at the moment, don't we? Because we need someone to find a cure for COVID. And we would hope that one of our children potentially could be that, that scientist that is um, solving uh, a, a worldwide um, problem. All right, so we, we really, we want our children to be scientists and solve problems that are gonna make a difference in the world. Um, so definitely engaging in discovery, scientific discovery is a big part of that. So it's not all about um, just learning about facts, it's, it's about exploring um, and exploring those facts with your children. So on that note, I'm just looking at the time. I've got time for a, another couple of questions if anybody has any, right? any questions? And things, different things that, that happen, like, um, for example, in the environment, like bushfires and why do they happen and, and doing a discovery and investigation about that. 
in Australia at the moment. We've just, um, we've just, oh, we've got a question. Question above. Just looking for a question here. Yep, answered that one. Sorry, I'm just making sure I answer all the questions that are coming in. Yep, so we talked about what time, what age a child begins to discover from birth. As soon as they're born, they discover. And um, definitely the same, yes, we'll definitely um, add all those links that I've talked about today to the website and make sure that that's all updated for you because I I've been finding some such fantastic resources that will help you um, and keep you busy during this time with your children. Um, and I think I've answered them all. I'm just going to double check that I've answered all the questions. Any others coming through? So I was talking about bushfires and things that have happened in the environment that, um, that are natural occurring. Um, so there's lots of disasters that happen without focusing too much on the disasters with children, but we can talk about why things like bushfires happen, particularly with our older children as well, um, because that's scientific discovery too. Um, and um, oh, thank you for for adding that to the to the chat website um and yes yeah, so talking to that without getting without focusing too much on the negative um lots of awful things that are happening in the world um but focusing on why things like bushfires happen and things like that or floods or natural disasters that's a really great conversation for discovery as well and you can discover with your child um, it's good to acknowledge that that's happening um, without the focus being on it. So looking at the science of why it ha it's happening is great. So during the butterfly act video, what supports this activity? So um, I imagine that the lead up to that activity was um, finding a butterfly, having um, a discovery of butterflies in the playground. So. Um, that I shared that with you because that could potentially happen with you with your child finding um, an insect or a butterfly and then you search use the, the iPad or the iPhone to search some facts about that butterfly and what she was doing she was using open-ended questioning so she wasn't just giving the, the children all the answers she was asking those thoughtful questions um, and I should have highlighted that during that video too so those thoughtful open-ended questions about why, why do you think those circles are there? So getting the children to really think about, oh, why? Oh, they look like eyes. Oh, that's a defense mechanism so that, um, so that the, the, the birds of prey or the birds or whatever, whatever um, predator is after that butterfly is scared away because it's actually thinking that, that it's bigger than what it is. So talking about um, every living thing has a defense mechanism. So what are the, exploring what different defense mechanisms are with each um, living thing is a, a great discovery um, activity with your children. So talk, you know, you, and it, that might be just looking through um, the internet with them about different animals or different things that you find around your home. If, you, if you're if you not being able to go outside, then um, then think about what usually you see in your environment and do, do some scientific discovery around um, those um, animals or living things or um, and their defense mechanisms, their facts, their what they eat, their habitat, where they live, um, and what why do they live near you? What's unique about your environment? Um, so those ladybird, the ladybird example that I give in, gave in the workshop um, of a child finding a ladybird, I haven't I've, I um, have moved to this small place from um, a large metropolitan area like Sydney. And we only have about 8,000 people here. And I'd never seen those ladybirds ever before. So 
that I didn't know what they were. So I led a discovery with that child to find out and search. And now I know that they're very, very common to this area. I see them all the time in my yard. I'm, I'm, my house is surrounded by gum trees. So I have a lot of those around, um, around the yard. Okay, so another question, I have a question. There is a group of children playing and others watching the video. How can the children who play discover the outside world? Does the teacher have a role after the group that watches the video finishes? Yeah, so that the, the group of children that were watching the video with that um, particular educator were interested. They might have been a part of that discovery. So they were looking, obviously finding um, butterflies in the playground and interested. Or one child could have had an interest in that butterfly or they might, that child might have brought, might have seen a butterfly at home and um, and started that whole investigation around butterflies. So um, it can be just from one, that level of inquiry um, can be just from one child or it can be a group of children. The other children that were just playing in the area um, were not part of that investigation, but that's okay because then another investigation might start and they could be, um, and they were allowed to be a part of that as well. They could come over, it was a very free um, play environment. So they were just busy doing other things, digging in the sand pit or climbing um, over the climbing equipment or um, riding their bikes. They weren't all involved in that, that um, discovery about the butterflies, but that's okay because they, they're, they're all having their own discoveries and, um, and other educators will enhance that. So um, it's all about using, making the most of every opportunity to, um, to discover with the children. So just notice things. So with your child, just notice, point, have a different lens on, I call it a different lens, having a, um, a, a STEM lens, I call it, because there's lots of, um, this is part of STEM, STEM practice. Yeah, oh, thank you very much. It was nice to meet you too. Um, and yes, so thank you for your very thought provoking questions as well. Really, um, really appreciate your interest as well. So hopefully I've answered those questions for you. Yeah, but um, be open for investigation and discovery with your children. Are there any other questions to finish? Really enjoyed today and enjoyed sharing that a little bit with you and um, and thinking of you and us and the world at this time. So it's really nice to have this amazing program to support parents, um, particularly when there's a lot of children spending a lot of time at home in, um, at the moment. I, I, I think that you're still on holidays or vacation. You haven't gone back to school yet, um, but um, yeah, hopefully things get a little bit more back to normal with um, your children. Then if nothing else is coming through, thanks again for joining me today and um, feel free to book in for the mass where we play with patterning and symmetry next week. Um, we're going to explore that with um, objects and items that we have in our houses. So um, I'm actually going to play with that with you. So, um, and we will share those links to the, the websites with you after the workshop as well. I'll send them through to the team and they'll add it to the website. That was nice, getting that feedback. Bye.